So the following interview is being conducted with Dr. Betty Siddharth for the Purdue University Libraries Archives and Special Collections Oral History Program. It is taking place on April 23rd, 2019 uh, at Dr. Siddharth's home in West Lafayette. The interviewer is Katie Watson, the France A. Cordova archivist. So, uh, today's interview, we're gonna be talking about um, Betty Sidorov's relationship with Helen Bass Williams. Um, so, Betty, uh, you worked with, um, or you worked at Purdue around the same time as Helen Bass Williams. Um, how did you guys, how did you two first meet? Uh, and what was the nature of your relationship? Well, we first met uh, as a result of both working in the uh, School of Humanities, Social Science, and Education in the uh, counseling and advising office of the uh, of our administration. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> it was a fairly large group of people because all the advisors were working out of that office. But it turned out that I shared an office with Helen Bass Williams mm -hmm. for, she came in 1968 and I came in 1967. And uh, I left in 72 and I think she left in 71. So our positions overlapped and we were in the same room mm -hmm. when we'd be walk, dealing with students or, or any kind of work we were doing in that office. We would we would be in that particular room. So um, she heard a lot of conversations I was having with people and I heard a lot of conversations she was having with people. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, you know, we'd then have conversations yeah. <laughs> between you. And uh, so got to got to know her pretty well. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that was great because she was really the the one in charge of trying to recruit more black students and um, as a result of that she had to make a, a lot of presentations around the campus okay. describing what she was trying to do and how they were doing it and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and I I heard a lot of those because oh, okay. I was just in the audience for those, but uh, she she had a, a really, I think, excellent approach to what she wanted to accomplish. Okay. Um, <clears throat> she wanted to be sure that she didn't, I remember one, at one of her meetings, she made the comment that she hadn't come to create a revolving door. Mm -hmm. meaning bringing in students that weren't qualified, couldn't really do the work, and so they would have to drop out. Okay. She wanted to bring in potential students that could really make it mm -hmm. with maybe some extra help and so forth, but at least they had a chance. And and I, I always, well, I think that's a good idea for any student. Yeah. <laughs> but in particular, those that hadn't had any opportunities before, and they, they had a lot of other things that were troublesome for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I think she really made tremendous efforts to make sure she, she brought students in that could be successful. Okay, and so was that why she was hired? Was she hired to help recruit students yes. for Purdue? Yes, she was. Okay. Uh, I'm sure that was a piece of it. Well, I know that was a piece of it. Oh, yeah. okay, yeah. and so were these presentations to other members across campus, or were they, I, what were the presentations for that, that she was doing? That's a good question, and I'm not absolutely certain, but I'm guessing that a good bit of it was for the faculty members in the School of Humanities, Social Science, and oh, Education, okay. because <clears throat> at that point in time, that was probably the best school for most of these freshmen, mm -hmm. because uh, they they just really, if they had potential, nobody had tapped it. Mm -hmm. So I think probably it was mostly faculty of the of HSSE. Okay. But I know that 
we as counselors went to hear a lot of the things that she had to say, and that that point really stuck in my brain that she wanted to make sure that we were not handicapping them to the point where they couldn't they couldn't succeed. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, so before coming to Purdue, uh, Helen Bass Williams worked in the South during the Martin Luther King Jr. era. Um, she was really involved in the civil rights movement. Did she ever, so you worked pretty closely with her being in the same office um, and then like, having a close relationship as well. So uh, do you know anything about her involvement or uh, what she did before she came to Purdue? Well, the only thing that I know is that she was involved in that, but it was the only information I have on it is what she told me. I, I didn't know her before she came to work mm -hmm. in HSSE, and uh, I, we, did, we did do some social things together. She used to come out to my house uh, for dinner every once in a while. Mm -hmm. She enjoyed meeting my two children and and uh, she li we lived out in the country and we had big trees around and she she said to me one time when I come back to this world I want to come back as a tree <laughs> <laughs> she loved it she loved the area yeah. and uh, she was she was very social yeah. and uh, she talked about her life and and I know she did she was involved in all those things, but I have no uh, no specific uh, events that she told me about. Oh, okay. She really didn't talk about that all that much. Oh, okay. She was much more interested in what she was currently doing. Okay. So she wasn't, she was more interested in kind of talking about currently helping out students. Yes. She was doing around Purdue. Yes. Okay. Yes. So when Helen Bass Williams was hired, so she started um, 1968, so a year after you started in the uh, student services office. Um, so there was a lot going on on campus around this time. So um, there were some civil rights protests happening right here at Purdue. Um, can you tell me kind of like what the culture was like in Lafayette and West Lafayette at the time, and what was the culture like at Purdue for black and African American students yeah. from what you experienced being here? I, I can't relate specifically to the, the black students because there were so few of them until she started recruiting some. But there was a lot of student unrest because that was the era of the Vietnam War and the uh, People were protesting a lot of things. We had quite a, quite a number of protests on the campus. Nothing like uh, Berkeley or some mm -hmm. of these other schools, but we did have a situation where they uh, took over the union. I do remember that. Oh, okay. And uh, the ringleaders snuck out, but the regular students that were involved in it. A lot of them were arrested, and I had, uh, as as a, uh, as someone I was advising, I had four students that actually I I believe, as I recall, they they did have to stay out a semester. They were expelled oh, they for were a expelled. semester because okay. they they did some damage in mm -hmm. the union and you know it was just everybody was very upset over the fact that they had uh, protested Protest. like that and but they weren't protesting on civil rights they were protesting the Vietnam War oh, okay but uh, this the, I think the civil rights for blacks was already everybody knew they absolutely had to do something mm -hmm. so I think Helen Bass Williams came at the right time because yeah. there was a positive attitude that we needed to do this mm -hmm. and uh, so she she set about doing it in such a way that it would be successful 
Okay. And it was. Mm-hmm. After she came, or around the time that she came, um, there were a few protests. So there was one where a group of students lay bricks in front of what's now Hufty Hall to protest for the uh for civil rights for African Americans, Pam Kang did the Black Power salute. There was also a march down um, to the Lafayette or the courthouse in Lafayette uh, in support of another African American student. Was do you know if Helen Bass Williams was involved with those in any way, or do you know? I I do not know the answer to that. Yeah. I as far as I know, she was not. Okay. I think my. My feeling was sharing the office with her and everything. Her her style was to work with individual students, mm -hmm. and she was she didn't just say, "Okay, what courses do you want and how do you want to do this?" Not just looking at their academics, but she wanted to know all about what was happening in their lives because a lot of that was very important if they were trying to to take care of parents back home were, because most of them came from Indianapolis, that first round that, that okay. she recruited. And uh, a lot of them came in with family issues. And since I was chairing the office, I overheard some of that, uh, that were troublesome. Mm -hmm. And uh, she worked with them on that. She really was, she was a total counselor, I would say. Okay. She she wasn't just saying, okay, what courses do you want? She was actually... Working with them on like personal working, issues? Yes, and, yes, okay. yes. Not just academics. And sure. uh, she she made sure they had a place to stay, and, you know, she was, she was really dealing with the whole person, which, okay. which I admired very much. And was that so... Was that originally what she was hired to do? Was she hired as a counselor? Or did she have other aspects of her position well? Well, she was actually had a uh, instructor position in French. Okay. But I do not know that whether she ever taught any French or not. I think she was specifically hired okay. to do this job. Okay. Even, although that may not be the way it was advertised. Okay. And so when she recruited students, did she travel to places like She went to Indianapolis. Yes, she she went to Indianapolis and she interviewed them down there, I think. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then she would promote Purdue and try to... Would she also help them find, like, the financial means? Yeah, and I think there was, uh, there was other sources where they were tapping into that she could probably arrange financial aid mm -hmm. in a way that... You couldn't if it wasn't a special group. Okay. I don't. I don't know that for sure, but I. Uh, and she never talked about that, other than that they had it, mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I don't know how involved she was in getting it, but but I know they were. They did want to get more black students here, mm -hmm. and they, the way you do that is with some scholarships and financial aid. Okay. So, how, when Helen Bass Williams first came to Purdue, so she was the first black faculty member at Purdue. I, right? I'm, I don't know whether she was or not. There were a couple over in uh, School of Management that were about here at the same time, if not okay. that. They might have been here a little earlier than that. Oh, okay. But, yeah. Okay, I thought that she was the first black well, faculty member. Well, I could be mistaken okay. on that, but I do know that there were there were very very few. Mm -hmm. How was she? How was she received by other faculty? Were they excited that she started? I think a lot of them, particularly in other schools, didn't even know she was here. Oh, okay. Because they were off, you know, in their field, and and yeah. uh, HSSE was sort of the. They had to prove themselves a lot more than, say, the mm -hmm. School of Science or the School of Engin Schools of Engineering and the, mm -hmm. the Pharmacy School and so forth. Everybody knew what that meant, yeah. and 
in in HSSC there were lots of programs and and uh, so I think many of those other schools didn't even have any clue as to what was what was going on in HSSC. Okay. Um, what about like within the HSSC faculty? Yeah, I think they were interested, and I'm sure that that uh, some of the gatherings that uh, where she made presentations and so forth were were well attended mm-hmm. by those people. They were very interested in in improving okay. the situation. And did she work closely with any other faculty that you know of? I think that 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 council that uh, they set up for that probably she wor- she worked okay. with them but I think she more more than anything made presentations so that people could understand what the situation was and and I think she got some good response from general faculty that were interested in the whole okay whole and thing. the need for having Yes. For encouraging more African yes. American and Black students to come yes. to Purdue. Yes. Okay. I think the thing that impressed me the most when I was sharing the office with her was how how she dealt with the entire student, not just you know, okay, here's these five courses. This is what you need to take. You know that. That uh, was not her style at all, mm-hmm. and um, there were some of her students that couldn't find a place to stay, for example, and she would manage to get that arranged. And she did a lot of other activities to help them succeed. Okay, so when they couldn't find a place to stay, was it just there wasn't any space in residence, or? It's probably some of both. Okay. No space and also didn't want them. Okay. And so there was so still she, a little bit. Oh, yeah. It was hard for oh, yeah. African-American or black students to find places to stay on campus? Well, I don't think it would have been like in the in the university housing. Mm-hmm. But if you wanted an apartment or you couldn't afford university housing and you wanted a room somewhere, uh, I think there were students that had difficulties with that okay. and uh, she made sure that they had something she okay. also made sure that they got meals that they needed to get that they weren't skipping food okay. because they couldn't afford it and things like that mm-hmm. she she was treating the whole person yeah so all of their needs yes okay and how did she how did she do that with um, getting the meals? I did hear stories. Well, she that did she a lot cooked, of them. <laughs> she, she cooked for them. Yes, yes, yeah. she did. And uh, she she would ask them when yeah. they come in to about a course or something, and she'd want to know, okay, what did you have to eat today? Wow, <laughs> and very guy, motherly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. She did. Great, and so she had a house on campus that she cooked. I th- yes, students. yes, I think she did. And and the and other thing she did, because I used to see her out at uh, MCL and places around for lunch, mm-hmm. and she frequently had a couple of students with her. She okay. Was, she was getting them fed. Oh, that's really important. Yeah. Great. Um, so... Helen Bass Williams, um, so she worked primarily with minority students, um, both at Purdue and in her personal life. Um, So she was um, a counselor at Hissey, and also um, I do remember that she rented out rooms in her house to students who had trouble finding housing as well. Do you remember anything about that? I know that she had some there. Yeah. Um, I've assuming that some of them probably they didn't they may not have even paid any rent my guess is if they were really in dire need she would not charge them okay but i know she was getting food for them so Mm -hmm. so you worked in the same office as helen um 
And so you probably observed, like, saw her interacting with students. What kind yeah. of um, interacting style did she have? She was pretty direct. Yeah. Uh, but they, they liked her. They, they were really. Um, they would come back and they would, you know, they, she'd know, she'd remember what they discussed and, mm-hmm. and. Um, she interacted very well with them. Yeah. She related to them very well. And did she work? So was it primarily up to the students to get in contact with her, or did she reach out to all of these students? Well, I think she probably at the at the beginning would have reached out to them because she did recruit them, and she probably had some style. And I do not know what this was, but I know that there, at the beginning of every semester, you'd you'd have an influx of students mm-hmm. that would come to see her. But after that, I think it was up to them to come in. But that doesn't mean she didn't check on them, because I'm sure she did. Because yeah. she knew them all pretty well. Mm-hmm. She knew who they were when they came in the door. I, I was never able to do that with the students I had, because they were so varied. Yeah, you need and, to have a good memory as yeah, well. And they usually had totally different uh, areas in which they were interested, so you... <clears throat> You didn't know what the question was going to be ahead yeah. of time, but I think in her case, there were a lot of times she didn't know what that was going to be. Mm-hmm. So, you and Helen both worked in the same office, so you're both working for um, in the counseling office, and she had a strong role in um, student support. And then you were working as a research coordinator in the counseling office. Is that correct? Well, I did. I did some research for the dean's office. Yes. Okay. I, I did several studies uh, for them that they wanted to find out. They had some questions, and one of the things that all the schools had to do at that time was uh, periodically they had to summarize activities within the school mm-hmm. and uh, talk about the enrollment trends and all the different things that were going on within the the academic part of the, of the school and uh, this was before you had computers where you could make your graphs and everything mm-hmm. without any difficulty it had to be by hand pretty much and uh, and I made several of those reports for the dean. And okay. this was a, the uh, top administration, the president, vice presidents, mm-hmm. and so forth, would, would meet with the school, mm-hmm. the dean and, and his associates, and they would present this report to them. Mm-hmm. And so I prepared a couple of those for the dean. Okay. And they were time-consuming. Yeah. <laughs> and... Uh, tried to make it interesting for them and and uh, the first one that I did I was I was really happy because Dean the Dean was um, Dean Ogle at the time and uh, he uh, he told me after the meeting that that the president was President Hubby at the time said, you ought to get these out for other schools to see because this was really good. Awesome. <laughs> <'Cause>, <laughs> That's you know, I, had, I had all these graphs and things in there, which had taken me a lot of time. Yeah. <laughs> they did look pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I did that kind of thing for the dean. And not, like I said earlier, I think about that, uh, um, the the requirements for the elective courses and how they uh, didn't want to take the modern language courses mm-hmm. and so we had this study going. I did those kind of things for them. Okay, and that study was um, they were required to take a modern language? Yeah, you, you were had looking at... Well, there were so many people that were objecting, to, so many students that just thought that was they didn't need to know another language, they didn't want to know another language mm-hmm. and and uh, so they were always asking for waivers mm-hmm. by saying, I don't, I just can't do it. I, I don't have the capability. That was the one thing they would admit to, that oh, okay. they didn't have the capability. So uh, 
we we set up this this study where mm-hmm. we said, okay, you can sign up for. I'm not going to. I can take anything with a thirty hour course requirement for for a variety in mm-hmm. in the humanities, and it turned out that they they did it. it it didn't matter. Mm-hmm. You could you could let them choose, and if they didn't want language, okay, just just let it go. Mm-hmm. Okay, and that was you did that while you were working. Yes. in the counseling office. Yes. So yes. you you and Helen had really different roles. Yes. In that yes. office, but yes. you were still part. The of only, The only the only common role we had was sign them up for courses. Okay. Oh, we, so we she did, signed students up yeah, for courses as yeah, well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, you were, so you, you were working pretty close together, though, in very different roles. Did you yes. ever work on any projects together? No, and I wish we had. Yeah. Because I think it would have been very helpful yeah. to find out if there were some characteristics of the more successful students that she was working with. Okay. You know, but we did as... I was never asked to do any of those, and yeah. I was I had plenty of other things to do, so mm-hmm. it wasn't until I was thinking about this later that I thought we really should have been following them more closely to see how successful they were. Mm-hmm. These students that she recruited yes. to see how yes. they did at Purdue and whether they yes. made it to the end of end of the degree, their degree, yes. I guess. Yes, we should have been looking at the degree results, yeah. and mm-hmm. yes, we certainly should have. Yeah, it's always, it's hard looking back and realizing Well, those. <laughs> yes, I'm sure in research that's what we do. We say, yeah. hey, I, why didn't I think of doing that? <laughs> yeah, hindsight yeah. is wonderful and terrible, terrible but... <laughs> yeah. Uh, so... Helen Bass Williams um, was really only at Purdue for 10 years. So she was here from 1968 to 1978 when she retired. Um, So she helped establish uh, the Black Studies program, um, kind of lay the groundwork to establish the Black Cultural Center and the Learning Center, which is now the Academic uh, Success Center. Do you um do you know anything about her involvement in these programs? So she would have, I imagine the so specifically, I guess um, the Black Studies program. So, so she started the African American Studies I, program. I I really don't mm-hmm. know. Uh, I don't know she had other people working with her on that. Um, but I I really can't answer how how involved she was compared to others because there were there were activities going on in other parts of the university but i think her program was more concentrated on getting the students here and getting them going and mm-hmm. you know helping them succeed which of course would fit in with that approach anyway to to get the black black studies program yeah. going and so forth and, she, and I know she did work with other faculty to try to get get that moving. Oh okay. Yeah. Do you remember which faculty? I'm sorry, it's been too long. Oh no, worries. <laughs> I don't <Yeah>. remember. <laughs> no, but I'm just I I out I think, of my own curiosity. Well, I think probably like the political science department and the history department and mm-hmm. some of those were probably pretty active in it. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so you stayed on at Purdue until ni- 1994. Do you, what were the effects of well, some of these programs that were uh, established during Helen's well, time? Uh, yeah, I stayed on until nine. 19- 1996, actually. Oh, okay, 96. So I was here for a long time. <laughs> but <clears throat> a lot of things happened. Of course, there was a lot more legislation from the federal government and more things that people had to do to to be non-discriminating against not only uh, blacks but, but uh, women and, mm-hmm. and lots of other 
groups that were being discriminated mm -hmm. against. Uh, and so there was a lot of involvement in throughout the university, more so than just like humanities having this program. Mm -hmm. And um, so they were a lot of other schools began to to try to get more 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 minorities mm -hmm. or more women into their programs. Mm -hmm. Engineering, for one, put forth yeah. a lot of effort to try to get students. Mm -hmm. Um, and w once once I became the registrar, I we did furnish information of a to them so they could make some decisions on what they ought to be doing. Mm -hmm. But we didn't do any studies for them. No. Okay. But there were there were there was a lot of activity of trying to open up the the programs to. Uh, other groups. Okay, to attract them or yeah, yeah. make sure that they yeah. can succeed? There was a time period, for example, in admissions when you could not ask mm -hmm. what their race was, mm -hmm. for example. It was a, it was actually a law, I think. Mm -hmm. And then they changed it. They wanted to know because they wanted to say, okay, you couldn't say if you didn't ask people if what their race was, you couldn't say how many do we have of this mm -hmm. particular category. So they, they realized they had to get the information. That didn't mean that you had to broadcast it all over the place, but it didn't mean if you wanted to know, am I serving this population, mm -hmm. you had to know about them. So mm -hmm. they had to identify themselves. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of a, well, <laughs> a yeah. juggling action to to do the thing yeah. that, that you wanted to do and make it helpful mm -hmm. uh, and, not discriminatory. And, not dis and not discriminate against them. And that was the reason before they didn't want you to give it mm -hmm. or ask for it because that was discriminating. Yeah. Well, and then when you want to know, do I have a group here that makes some sense, you know, you have to ask the question. Mm -hmm. So now it, it is on forms. Mm -hmm. And they, there was a time you couldn't take, many, many years ago, you used to, I think you had to submit a photograph, you couldn't do that. Yeah. And uh, I, I'm sure they don't even require that now at all, and they haven't for a long time, but there was a period of time when you did that, but the, one of the reasons that they were doing it was to find out whether you were of a minority group or not. Okay. I mean, and that's that what that's what people were... felt. And that's why they yeah. said, no, 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 you shouldn't be allowed yeah. to do that. And was was that because, so they'd have you submit a photo because they didn't have a box where you would, they weren't allowed to ask what? Well, it was at the same time, I think. Yeah. You did both of those at the same time, oh, pretty much. Oh, okay. Yeah. So what was the purpose of the photo then, if they already... Well, at one yes, you're right. At one point in time, they probably did not ask you to check something, but if they got that photo, they could oh, okay. figure it out. Do you know what time period that was in? Do you remember? Oh, that was a long time ago. Oh, okay. Yeah. They, uh, uh, when they took the, well, when they put the requirement back on that you had to get, you had to have a, box so that you could say we've had this many of this eth ethnic group uh, you had to report that to the federal government actually mm -hmm. so that was probably done well like I said they were asked to take it off because they felt like they did not admit these students once they had that information Yeah. so they were discriminating against a group so they wanted it off, so they had to take it off. And then when they realized, but we need to know if we've been successful or not mm -hmm. in getting recruiting these students. So they put it back on, and um, that probably happened about the same time some of these other protests were going on. So like late 60s? Yeah, that's okay. what I would say. Yeah. Okay, when they put the check mark yeah. box back in. Yeah. Okay.
And now I think they've got a category where you can claim you're not only biracial, but multiracial. Oh, okay. Uh, okay. That would make sense. Yeah, it does. Yeah. So, Helen Bass Williams um, served on the first executive board of the Black Faculty and Staff Council at Purdue. Um, did you notice, so, did you notice any differences that this made after this was established? Um, or what, like, the impacts of this was? Well, I'm sure at the Even time it were, was kind of hard to find enough to get a council mm -hmm. because they just weren't there. But so you didn't work with many other African American or black there were colleagues. There were a few in um, some of the administrative p positions, mm -hmm. uh, and then they they did uh, they did actually have uh, someone and I I can't say what the title was, but it was sort of somebody in the upper administration that was getting all these reports developed that needed to go back to the federal government and mm -hmm. all these places. Um, and they were active around in the university. Mm -hmm. But there weren't a whole lot of faculty mm -hmm. that there were there were clerical people we in in the registrar's office we had a couple that okay. worked there for years and years. Mm -hmm. Um but there wasn't there wasn't a real I, I i think helen's program was probably the biggest one that was going on at the time okay i don't know of anybody else that was working as hard or doing as much to get a group of students that could be successful mhm mm okay and she actually was nominated for the helen schleman award Oh, which yeah. uh, just is given to one person every year. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I was on the committee that was working on selecting one mm -hmm. what, well, for a couple of years. And the year that she was nominated, um, and I was now over in the registrar's office, mm -hmm. um, her name came up. And I was on that committee, and uh, and she won the award, great. which was great. It was really wonderful. And then what what did she win the award for? Was Her service, for? what she'd been doing for the university. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So recruiting African-American students and providing them yeah. with yeah. the services they need. So Yeah. Okay. Did you attend that award ceremony? Oh, I did, yes. Yeah. Was she surprised? Did she know that she was going to, uh, that she had been nominated? She knew she'd been nominated, oh, yeah. okay. But I don't know whether they tell them ahead of time or not. Mm -hmm. I really don't. But uh, my guess is she probably had some suspicions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but it was it was great that she did win yeah. that. So she sounds like she was probably a pretty personable very much person. Very much so. Okay. Yeah. So she was very she got along she, well with most yes. people she worked yes. with and the only the only time she would be a little strong mm -hmm. was when she felt like they were they were incorrect in what they believed. It, like this business of, well, let's just go out and get the poorest and the the least educated high schoolers and bring them in. That was the that's well, what some people. Said. Well, yeah, it was just we've we've got to have them, so let's just go get them. And uh, I think her point that I'm not creating a revolving door here, okay. which is you know if you bring in people that don't have a chance for success. Uh, you you have to develop some other program first to get them ready, which is probably what she was trying to do for that with that learning center that you were mm -hmm. talking about. But she she wanted to get 
she wanted to prove that they could be just as good and do just as well and and I think I think it did work that mm-hmm. way. So was it the am- administration then? Who was it who had this idea to kind of round up? Well, I think the whole the whole country had that idea. Oh, okay. I mean, I think that was just sort of an attitude. Well, you know, let's just go get some. And, okay, so like let's show that we're yeah. supporting these students. Yeah. But we don't have the services. So Helen was really focused on That's finding right. people who already... They had potential. She could prove the yeah, potential academic. was there. That's yeah. right. And it, and I'm sure it wasn't successful in every case, but, but it was more successful than just going out and scooping a bunch of people up. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so she had a much she, more involved yep, recruiting yep, policy. Yep. And uh, I think demonstrated that it really worked. Because there have been some very successful... Um, Black students go through Purdue. Mm-hmm. I think. I think the chairman of the board or the president of of um, McDonald's is black. Oh yeah. Okay. I believe so. I could be wrong on that, but I think it, somebody like that yeah. <laughs> anyway. And because uh, he's been at Purdue and talked about it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well. I- Race doesn't affect how effective you can be, right? So yes, yeah, yes, and uh, and, it, and really, she was in a kind of a quiet quarter, mm-hmm. corner. She wasn't really uh, out. Every, I'm not saying that people didn't know who she was because they did, but they didn't know what she was doing. I don't think. Was she I, was more I focused on students. She was absolutely yeah. yeah. And I think that, you know, they were engrossed in whatever programs they were in, and they mm-hmm. didn't pay any attention to it. Mm-hmm. And it was, I I was fortunate enough to see it <laughs> firsthand because we shared an office. Yeah. But uh, I can say she did a lot for the university. Because mm-hmm. you went there. You attended Purdue. Yes, I did. Before she came. So you oh, know yes. kind of what the culture was like before well, she Well, yes. Arrived. When I uh, was an undergraduate student, I lived in the Windsor Halls for the first year. You had to do that as a freshman woman uh, in, that, in that era. You couldn't, only women had to live in? Purdue. Only, yeah. Yes, men could live wherever they wanted to, but when you couldn't you couldn't enroll if you weren't uh, living in one of the women's dorms as a freshman woman yeah yeah and uh, I do remember that uh, it wasn't in the dorm I was in but in one of the Windsor halls there were two black girls two that's mm-hmm. it and how many pe- how many women well the student there? body was pretty good sized when I came because it was after right after World War II when mm-hmm. the GI were coming back and so you had high enrollments, higher than they'd been. Mm-hmm. Uh, and certainly we could have found more than two black students. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember, I'm sure there were some black men on the campus, but I don't remember seeing them. Mm-hmm. But I did see these girls because they'd be going out to class yeah. same time I was. Uh, and that must have been hard for yeah. them to be the only two. That must have been very isolating. Yes, I'm sure they were. Mm-hmm. Did you ever speak to them? I never really got close to them. I, they would just be walking down the sidewalk, and I would be on the other side because yeah. they were in a different dorm. Mm-hmm. Um, Was that kind of indicative of Lafayette and West Lafayette as well? Uh, I would think it probably was, mm-hmm. yeah. West Lafayette, I think, would probably not have had many black people in it at all, Mm -hmm. in the town. So, not that you would have experienced, but do you know... Do you know whether they were welcomed into the West Lafayette area or the Lafayette area? Like, how welcoming was the situation for students who may not have necessarily been from here, um, for 
African American students moving to predominantly white communities. Community. Well, I don't think it would have been very good at the time when I was here as a student mm -hmm. because it wasn't that good in the general society. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there's this is, was a very probably even more isolated certainly West Lafayette even more isolated than a lot of universe a lot of places. Mm -hmm. Uh, but it, there were lots of places in Indiana where you, if you were black, you better be out of the town before ten o'clock or whatever. They in had Indiana? a they had yes, that's what I was told by uh, somebody that studied this thing. And like I told you earlier, the Elwood basketball team wouldn't play the Kokomo team because. Um, they had a black fellow on the team. On the Coco On the team. basketball team, yeah. Yeah, and that. So, so the Kokomo said, well, we, <laughs> Kokomo said, we, we're not coming. <laughs> and we that's take them off, took them off the list. Yeah. That's encouraging, anyways. Well, it was, yes. When I heard about that years later, I thought, well, I'm. Proud of my to my hometown. <laughs> yeah, was that when you were living there? Because you grew up. You said you yes, grew up in Kokomo. I grew up in Kokomo. Yeah. Yes, I, it was. It was when you were. I was in high school. Yeah. When it happened, because they had the game scheduled, and then they told them they couldn't come. Yeah. Hmm. Was yeah. that, and was that common? Did you hear about other things uh, along those lines that happened? I didn't hear about as many as I I certainly knew. Well, of course, the whole northern part of Indiana had a lot of blacks, and they they were they had uh, segregated housing. Mm -hmm. There were communities that you just didn't go into if you were black mm -hmm. or weren't allowed into. Uh, but. Uh, I was not aware of a lot of the discrimination that was going on in in other communities, mm -hmm. uh, but I I do know that I've seen reports since then about how they they had to be out of the town if they were visiting they had to be out before dark and this kind of stuff. Yeah. I I was not aware of that yeah. because my town wasn't like that. Yeah. I'm not saying that there wasn't discrimination going on. I'm sure there was, mm -hmm. but it wasn't as noticeable. And and we 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 did have schools that were integrated, yeah. so they they didn't have a special school. Mm -hmm. um, and that wasn't the situation when you went to Purdue. Well, I don't know that <clears throat> there was any discrimination. They just didn't come. Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether if 15 more girls had wanted to come to Purdue and had applied, they might have all been admitted, because mm -hmm. I don't know the answer to why there were only two, but mm -hmm. that's what it was. Yeah, so there just wasn't a lot of representation here. That, that, I think that was part of it. I don't know that anybody said you can't come, mm -hmm. but uh, they may have self-selected. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, yeah. but I think uh, Helen Bass Williams made a big impact on the university, and I'm glad to see that, into that, more that they're student body. recognizing that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then um, so there's a Helen Bass Williams scholarship that was established in 1994, just a few years after she passed away, uh, and it was established to support minority students. Um, you were still at Purdue when this. Because you would have yes just yes I was retire, I was retiring as a registrar in ninety four I stayed on for two more years yeah. after that but do you know how this came about like how I don't I I didn't know about this till I got your questions oh okay uh, <clears throat> but <clears throat> I know that uh, there was there was a big drive to get scholarships going mm -hmm. for students because the financial 
obviously the financial cost to going to a school like Purdue is so much higher than it was, for mm-hmm. example, when I came. Mm-hmm. Um, <clears throat> but, <clears throat> excuse me, they've set up a lot of scholarships. Uh, the Purdue retirees have a scholarship endowment oh. going, uh, and they also funded one that... Uh, they, when uh, President Jiski retired, they set up a scholarship program to try to get several scholarships going mm-hmm. in his name, but they would also then put the organization in okay. there too. So the retirees set one of those up too. Okay. So that means you donate to the foundation, and mm-hmm. and that goes to a specific fund, and I'm sure that's how that works. Okay. The Helen Best. Mm-hmm. If you wanted to contribute to it, you could contribute. To yeah, it. and I think yeah. it's administered through the Black Cultural Center. Um, they they may, it, they yeah, may just, select the student. Yeah, it could be. Mm-hmm. Or on the other hand, they may have to go through financial aid, but they could put the criteria on what okay. they want. <clears throat> um, so Helen Boss Williams passed away in 1991 in Illinois. Um, I guess you hadn't been working together for a while at no, that point. No, I didn't actually, once I moved over to uh, the administration building, Hubdy Hall, <clears throat> I didn't see her. No? no. So you guys didn't keep in touch after that? No. Well, I, actually, <clears throat> yeah, they, we didn't. Okay. Um, she wasn't there very long after I left so Mm -hmm. but I I did know she had gone to Illinois Mm -hmm. and I didn't know she had died oh really so it was a bit of a surprise yeah I didn't ever see anything about it that I knew obviously later that she had died but I didn't know when until I saw these questions so then you didn't you didn't attend her funeral no you didn't know anyone I didn't I do not because I never nobody ever talked about it oh so you didn't know anyone who kept in touch with her after she left either, then? No, I don't. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because she left in 1998, and it, I guess it was a little while after that that she passed away, but... Yeah, so she retired not too long after you um, stopped working together and moved on to um, yeah. the registrar's office. Um. So are there any other memories of Helen Bass Williams that you want to share? Is there anything else? Well, I do remember uh, I had her come out to my house several times for dinner. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had two small children at the time. Uh, They were in grade school. but. They had a really good time with her, yeah, <laughs> and she had a good time with them they They really had a lot of fun and it was it was great to watch her yeah with uh, with two little kids yeah know? yeah, because I guess you'd only seen her with university yeah age that's right students, that's so. right yeah. and it, it, they still remember her fondly too oh do they, they? Re- yeah, they do so did she come over often then you guys well hung out a lot. No, not real often, because she usually had a lot of other things going on, you know, and mm-hmm. had special students she was working with and so forth. But um, <clears throat> enough times that she knew who they were and, and they had the same conversations with them and yeah. so forth, you know, so. Yeah. I considered her a good friend. Yeah. But it's... Sounds when like you, a very inspiring person to know. Yes. And, <clears throat> but when you leave a place, um, people don't, don't keep in touch with... Well, I shouldn't say that. A lot of people keep in touch, but it, it gets pretty easy to just get involved in other stuff mm-hmm. when you don't do it. Yeah, especially when you have other things going on. So I think she yeah. moved back to Illinois to help her mother. I think she, something along those lines. And then, uh, yeah, yeah, you, with two small children, I imagine you're pretty busy. 
Well, and I don't remember that there was any kind of um, recognition that she was moving and they had any kind of party here, you know. Oh, okay. So there wasn't when she like was leaving. Going away. If, there, if they did, I, I was not told about it. So. Okay. Okay, yeah, because I don't um, have a whole lot of information about that other than in her But a lot of times file. when people retire, they have a, a party, they have a party for them, yeah. Mm -hmm. But as far as I know, if they did, uh, I wasn't asked to come. So. Oh, okay. Yeah, I guess it could have just been through the hissy... Department. It could you have were been in a separate department at that by point. That, by that time, I was no longer over there. That's right. Okay. Okay. And interestingly, uh, at, at once I became the registrar, uh, when was it she retired? 1978. Yeah, she was gone by that time. But... If she had connect, you know, if she needed to deal with the registrar's office, she never got in touch with me. But mm -hmm. she would have been gone by that time. Yeah. Yeah, because it was you left that office in 1972, and then she was gone just six years later. So yeah, not too long after. Yeah, so yeah. it wasn't too long after. Switched. And if she if she had connect, if she had dealings with the office of the registrar in that from seventy two to seventy eight, and got in touch with the registrar, it wouldn't have been me. <laughs> would have yeah. been it would have been Mr. Parker's Your predecessor. Yeah. Yeah. So it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But and then I guess one last question: Do you know? Um, do you know anything about her? So we've talked a lot about her life at Purdue. Do you know um, what she did in her personal life? I do not. No? She okay. did not share that. She didn't? Okay. No. As far as I know, she had no children. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, she didn't. But I, um, she never talked about her husband or anything like that. So. Was she married while she was at Purdue? No. No. Okay. Okay. So it sounds or if she was, he was he, he wasn't, wasn't present. Here. Okay. Yeah, it sounds like she really dedicated all of her time. I I think to that Purdue yes, I think that's students. right. I think that's right. Mhm. Mm yeah. Well, is there anything else that you would like to add or talk about that we missed? Not that I can think of. Okay. But um, the, she had a lot of people that admired her. Mm -hmm. I know that. Yeah. She sounds like a very inspiring person. Yes. She had a lot of accomplishments while she was at Purdue and was really dedicated to helping students. Yes. So... Great. Well, thank you so much, Betty. Well, you're very it welcome. It's nice to meet you. Yeah, you as well. And thanks again for participating in our oral history project. Thank you.